By way of example, let's say it's an average adult day and you get up in the morning, go to your challenging white collar college graduate job and you work hard for eight or ten hours and at the end of the day you're tired and somewhat stressed and all you want is to go home and have a good supper and maybe unwind for an hour and then hit the sack early because of course you have to get up the next day and do it all again. But then you remember there's no food at home. You haven't had time to shop this week because of your challenging job. And so now after work you have to get in your car and drive to the supermarket. It's the end of a work day and the traffic is apt to be very bad. So getting to the store takes way longer than it should. And when you finally get there, the supermarket is very crowded because of course it's the time of day when all the other people with jobs also try to squeeze in some grocery shopping. And the store is hideously fluorescently lit and infused with soul-killing Muzak or corporate pop. And it's pretty much the last place you want to be. But you can't just get in and quickly out. You have to wander all over the huge, overlit store's confusing aisles to find the stuff you want. And you have to maneuver your junkie cart through all these other tired, hurried people with carts. Etc., etc., cutting stuff out because it's a long ceremony. And eventually, you get all your supper supplies, except now it turns out there aren't enough checkout lanes open, even though it's the end of the day rush. So the checkout line is incredibly long, which is stupid and infuriating. But you can't take your frustration out on the frantic lady working the register, who is overworked at a job whose daily tedium and meaninglessness surpasses the imagination of any of us here at a prestigious college. But anyway, you finally get to the checkout line's front, and you pay for your food, and get told to have a nice day in a voice that is the absolute voice of death. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, Morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, What the hell is water? The story thing turns out to be one of the better, less bullshitty conventions of the genre, but if you're worried that I plan to present myself here as the wise, older fish explaining what water is to you younger fish, please don't be. I am not the wise old fish. The point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Stated as an English sentence, of course, this is just a banal platitude, but the fact is that in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult existence, banal platitudes can have a life or death importance, or so I wish to suggest to you on this dry and lovely morning. Here's another didactic little story. There are these two guys sitting together in a bar in the remote Alaskan wilderness. One of the guys is religious, the other is an atheist, and the two are arguing about the existence of God with that special intensity that comes after about the fourth beer. And the atheist says, look, it's not like I don't have actual reasons for not believing in God. It's not like I haven't ever experimented with the whole God and prayer thing. Just last month I got caught away from the camp in that terrible blizzard, and I was totally lost and I couldn't see a thing, and it was 50 below, and so I tried it, I fell to my knees in the snow and cried out, oh, God, if there is a God, I'm lost in this blizzard, and I'm gonna die if you don't help me. And now, in the bar, the religious guy looks at the atheist all puzzled. Well then you must believe now, he says, after all, here you are, alive. The atheist just rolls his eyes. No, man, all that was was a couple Eskimos happened to come wandering by and showed me the way back to camp. Analyzing this situation from a liberal arts perspective, the same experience can be interpreted differently based on individuals' belief systems. We value tolerance and diversity of beliefs, avoiding the assertion that one interpretation is true and the other is false. However, we often neglect to discuss the origin of these beliefs within individuals. The assumption that one's worldview is hardwired or absorbed from culture overlooks the intentional choices in constructing meaning. Additionally, arrogance plays a role, as both non-religious and religious individuals can be overly certain in their dismissals or interpretations, exhibiting a close-mindedness that limits self-awareness. The point here is that I think this is one part of what teaching me how to think is really supposed to mean. To be just a little less arrogant. 
to have just a little critical awareness about myself and my certainties. Because a huge percentage of the stuff that I tend to be automatically certain of is, it turns out, totally wrong and deluded. I have learned this the hard way. Here is just one example of the total wrongness of something I tend to be automatically sure of, everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid and important person in existence. We rarely think about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive. But it's pretty much the same for all of us. It is our default setting, hardwired into our boards at birth. Think about it, there is no experience you have had that you are not the absolute center of. The world as you experience it is there in front of you or behind you, to the left or right of you, on your TV or your monitor. And so on. Other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, real. Please don't worry that I'm getting ready to lecture you about compassion or other directedness or all the so-called virtues. This is not a matter of virtue. It's a matter of my choosing to do the work of somehow altering or getting free of my natural, hardwired default setting which is to be deeply and literally self-centered and to see and interpret everything through this lens of self. People who can adjust their natural default setting this way are often described as being, well-adjusted, which I suggest to you is not an accidental term. As I'm sure you guys know by now, it is extremely difficult to stay alert and attentive, instead of getting hypnotized by the constant monologue inside your own head, may be happening right now. Twenty years after my own graduation, I have come gradually to understand that the liberal arts cliché about teaching you how to think is actually shorthand for a much deeper, more serious idea, learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to and to choose how you construct meaning from experience. Because if you cannot exercise this kind of choice in adult life, you will be totally hosed. Think of the old cliché about, the mind being an excellent servant but a terrible master. This, like many clichés, so lame and unexciting on the surface, actually expresses a great and terrible truth. It is not the least bit coincidental that adults who commit suicide with firearms almost always shoot themselves in, the head. They shoot the terrible master. And the truth is that most of these suicides are actually dead long before they pull the trigger. And I submit that this is what the real, no bullshit value of your liberal arts education is supposed to be about, how to keep from going through your comfortable, prosperous, respectable adult life dead, unconscious, a slave to your head and to your natural default setting of being uniquely, completely, imperially alone day in and day out. That may sound like hyperbole, or abstract nonsense. Let's get concrete. The plain fact is that you graduating seniors do not yet have any clue what, day in day out, really means. There happen to be whole, large parts of adult American life that nobody talks about in commencement speeches. One such part involves boredom, routine and petty frustration. The parents and older folks here will know all too well what I'm talking about. For instance, imagine a typical adult day. You work a challenging, white-collar job for 8 to 10 hours, feeling tired and stressed by the end. Eager to go home, have a good supper, and unwind, you realize there's no food. Due to your hectic job, you haven't had time to shop, so now you must drive to the supermarket after work. The traffic is terrible, and the store is crowded with other working individuals trying to do their grocery shopping. The environment is unpleasant, with harsh lighting and soul-crushing background music. Navigating the store to find what you need is a tedious process, and dealing with a cart amidst other tired shoppers is frustrating. Finally collecting your supplies, you encounter a long checkout line, exacerbated by a shortage of open lanes during the end-of-the-day rush. Despite your irritation, expressing it to the overworked cashier is unfair, considering the daily tedium and meaninglessness of her job. Eventually, you pay for your groceries and hear a robotic, have a nice day. Now, you must lug your groceries in flimsy plastic bags through a bumpy parking lot, pushing a cart with a malfunctioning wheel. The journey continues with a slow, traffic-laden drive home. 
Everyone has experienced situations like this, but it hasn't yet become a routine in your graduates' lives, day after week after month after year. However, it will. And many more mundane, irritating, seemingly pointless routines await. But that's not the point. The point is that these petty, frustrating situations are where the real work of choice comes in. Traffic jams, crowded aisles, and long checkout lines provide a moment for reflection. Without a conscious decision on how to think and what to pay attention to, shopping will be a source of anger and misery. The default setting is the belief that situations like this revolve around personal needs and feelings. It's easy to think everyone else is just in the way, and frustration builds. Yet, there are different ways to perceive these situations. Those SUVs in traffic might be driven by people with past traumatic accidents, making driving terrifying. The rude person in the checkout line might have struggles far beyond what's visible. The choice lies in how to consider these possibilities. Choosing to see beyond immediate annoyances is not easy. It takes effort and willpower, and some days it might be impossible. But on most days, if you're aware enough to give yourself a choice, you can view these situations differently. A real education offers the freedom to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. The choice of what to worship becomes crucial. Worshipping money, appearance, power, or intellect can lead to insatiable desires, insecurity, and a constant need for more. These are unconscious default settings that people slip into without realizing. The real world encourages operating on default settings, contributing to a pool of fear, anger, and self-worship. The most precious kind of freedom involves attention, awareness, and discipline. It's the freedom to care for others and make sacrifices daily, the real essence of education. This isn't about morality, religion, or life after death. It's about life before death, the true value of education lying in simple awareness, this is water. Staying conscious in the adult world is unimaginably hard, making your education the job of a lifetime. It commences now. I wish you more than luck. The truth will set you free, but not until it is finished with you. I probably wouldn't do anything differently. If I had to do it again, every little thing that happens to you, good and bad, becomes a little piece of the puzzle of who you become. Every successful person you read about, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, they all say pretty much the same thing. Do what? Don't do what you're taught to do, do what you love to do. We all suffer alone in the real world. True empathy is impossible.